trust everyone had a good evening last night. Yeah, good. I'd now like to ask Willie Doherty to give the standing orders report. Willie Doherty, Standing Orders Committee, presenting the third Standing Orders Report. Will Congress please note that emergency motions numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 and 14 were distributed yesterday. If you don't have a copy of them, please pick one up at the STUC help desk. Emergency Composite A, covering emergency motions 6 and 7, will be distributed in due course. Please note the following changes to the order of business. Motions 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 and 17 will now be debated on Wednesday at 12 noon. Please also note that the following emergency motions number 4 and 14 on PFI PPP will be debated this morning after Composite J. We will ask for both motions to be moved and seconded before inviting for further speakers. Following this emergency motion number 13, Karen Phoenix Falkirk will be debated. Motions number 26, 27 and emergency motion number 1 will be debated following motion 59. Emergency motion number 3, Western Bartonshire dispute will be debated at the beginning of the Education and Lifelong Learning section at 2.50pm this afternoon. Emergency motion number 12 will be debated before the Transport section at 4.10pm. Other emergency motions will be debated at various times on Wednesday and you will be informed of timings in due course. Any delegates wishing to be taken to speak in a debate should queue at the right hand side of the stage as you see it just here. This doesn't mean that everyone wishing to, be, to speak will be taken, but it will help to speed up proceedings. I move report number three. Thanks, Willie. Does Congress accept the report? Agreed. Thank you. We will now begin the morning session with motions on public services, section 5 of the agenda. Call Compensate B, covering motions 2 and 41 and amendment, public finance and developed, devolved public services. And I will ask Helen Connor to move. Morning, Congress. I suspect that I was actually put on to move this either to make sure that everybody was awake or, with my voice, to get people out of their hotels if they're still in there. Um, in moving this composite, I'd like to start on a reasonably positive note. I'd like to start by reiterating the need for decent public services throughout Scotland. Only by having decent public services throughout Scotland will we begin to tackle poverty and social injustice. What do decent public services actually mean? Well, I've got a few instances. They actually mean care packages for our elderly, which mean decent provision, not just 10 minute visits and then the carers rushing off to their next stop, leaving behind them a vulnerable elderly person and the carer going away feeling very guilty and undervalued. That's not the job our underpaid carers signed up for. Decent public services mean proper childcare facilities for our preschool children. Decent public services mean smaller class sizes to enable attainment and achievement to be tackled. Decent public services mean an NHS which is well resourced and tackles inequality of provision. So, why don't we have these decent public services and more? Well, we're told austerity is inevitable. Look at the crisis we inherited. Frankly, Congress, how long are the current government going to blame the past? They cannot continually talk about the crisis they inherited, the crisis that was caused by the bankers' crash. 
the crisis that isn't helped by the Panama Papers and tax avoidance. Austerity is a clear political choice. It is a clear political choice by those who have to wield their power over those who do not have. It is a clear political choice to decimate the public sector. After all, they don't use the public sector. They use the private sector. Let's not be in any doubt. None of this is happening by chance. This is a deliberate attack on the public sector across Scotland. Why? And I have to say, it really irritates me, and that's putting it mildly because uh, I'm in the position I'm in and I'm on this platform, I'm saying it really irritates me. Why is it the most vulnerable in our society who are targeted and who suffer the most all the time? The STUC has to lead the fight against these public service cuts by ensuring that action is taken across the public sector to protect these vital, vital services. Our challenge, and we are sending out this challenge for, from this Congress today, to any Scottish Government, to all local authorities, to public bodies and to political parties, to start opposing these cuts to services instead of passively implementing them. Why don't we have more Scottish local authorities challenging these cuts instead of scurrying around trying to find a way of implementing them? Why do we have a Scottish Government who is not prepared to use the powers that they have to make sure that these cuts do not take place. We also need to look at reforming local taxation. We have had a council tax freeze for many, many years without anybody saying really in a loud enough voice that a freeze on the council tax is per se not only a freeze on public services, it is a cut on public services, and a cut on public services that again, and I don't apologise for saying it, again our most vulnerable suffer. So my message at the end of this is to everybody, to local authorities, to political parties, to the government, to unions, have courage, be bold, back public services and be prepared to take action to protect them. I move. I call on Unison Scotland to second the composite. Uh, Unison uh, second the composite uh, uh, be president in Congress. In, in Scotland we have a, a, a kind of consensus now across uh, trade unions, civic society and most of the press and, with the exception of the Tories, the political parties, that the austerity policies of the UK Tory government are a disaster. It is bad enough, as Helen pointed out, uh, the impacts of austerity in local services from increases in charges for everything from child, child, uh, swim, children's swimming lessons to cremating the dead, a loss of college places and so on. But there is an increasing understanding that austerity economics in their own terms do not work. Reducing the spending power of public sector workers by cutting jobs and suppressing wages, <coughs> reducing the expenditure for councils and health boards, etc., results in lower demand in the economy, less revenue through taxation to the state, and as if by magic, that is the magic of some mad neoliberal magician, we have greater government borrowing, and the problem of public debt, which austerity is supposed to answer, uh, is getting bigger, uh, not, not smaller. Now, that is no surprise to us. Trade unions have been saying this from the outset. There was a time when Labour and the Lib Dems, as well as the Tories, were saying that austerity was the answer. We knew that <coughs> they were obviously asking the wrong question if they thought that was uh, the answer. So this is consensus that austerity isn't the right answer means that those in power in Scotland, in government, in local councils, in responsible uh, places in public, uh, public sector organisations, they have a responsibility that goes beyond simply condemning austerity. They need to oppose it in practical ways that protect services in local communities and build an alternative so that future public services can be delivered to meet the needs of people and not the fantasies and delusions of mad magicians. The cuts must be opposed. But how should they be opposed? Well, it was great to see the lobbies of Parliament organised by GMB United in unison to oppose the cuts 
the council budgets that the SNP were voting through. It was great to see so many Labour councillors and MSPs joining us. Better late than never, I suppose. But those kind of demonstrations, important as they are, they're not enough. We have to identify the practical ways in which we can actually oppose uh, the, uh, the, the austerity policies and the cuts. We must insist, as Helen said, that the Scottish politicians don't hide behind that it. it's all the fault of the Tories and we can't do anything about it line, which a number of them have held to for long enough. That was never good enough when the Scottish Government had few powers to tackle austerity. It's even less acceptable now that the Parliament has significant powers that they can choose to use. Unison's publication, Combat and Austerity, which you, you can get at the stall, you can even get signed copies of the stall if you speak to Big Dave Watson, um, it spells out the steps that councils and the government can take, and I commend it to every candidate for the Parliament and every councillor. <coughs> we should insist that they absolutely confirm there will be no compulsory redundancies anywhere in the public uh, sector. Any politician who doesn't make that commitment should be condemned by ourselves. The Edinburgh Schools fiasco has highlighted the disgrace of PFIs. These deals need to be changed through the use of prudential borrowing and bonds so that we don't continue to pay through the nose for decades to come. Local taxation needs to be reformed so that councils have a sustainable financial base. This includes different forms of tax raising powers and a fair local property tax. We have argued to, for an end to the council tax freeze from before it was actually implemented, colleagues. So it's good to see that the government finally is saying that it will end, although not until next year, and only so that they can then direct councils how they would spend any revenue uh, raised. It's a start, but it's clearly not good enough. We need to explore how we can use reserves and underspends properly to ensure that cuts don't uh, take Delegate place. Delegate, can you wind up? Yes, yeah, sorry. Right. We need to be creative in how we respond to this. We need to be practical in opposing it. I second the Commissary. GMB Scotland. President, Congress, Annette Dryley, GMB Scotland, supporting Composite B on behalf of every public sector worker in Scotland. I was far too drunk last night for to be able to read this, but I'll give it a try. <laughs> the Scottish Government's 5% cut in local government budget will have a devastating impact on our members. Right here in Dundee, the City Council is cutting the budget by £28 million, threatening 2,000 jobs and they're even looking at slashing maternity pay to their workers to the statutory minimum. Conference, are we returning to the dark ages? Do they honestly think that we should be hitting low-paid female workers to pay for the austerity agenda driven by the Tories and exacerbated by the SNP? Every public sector employee across Scotland is facing the same story as they are here, and COSLA estimates a further 15,000 cuts to the, on top of the 40,000 jobs we have already lost in local government since 2009. Cuts to terms and conditions have been implemented that will plunge local aid workers into the swelling ranks of Scotland's working poor. Local communities have seen their taxes they pay to deliver and protect essential services line in the pockets of financiers to pay for PPP projects. Instead, £1 million a month in the case of North Ayrshire, as GMB Scotland has uncovered. Governments at all levels are hanging the working class out to dry. Conference, enough is enough. The Scottish Government cannot resolve every crisis created by the austerity of the Tory Government, but they can mitigate the crisis in local government by using a full range of tax and spending powers which is now within their grasp. They can be bolder and stronger. They can be more radical and proactive. Conference, it is our job as trade unionists to ensure they turn the rhetoric into reality and hold them to their promises. Let's really hold the Scottish Government to account and ensure that they do just that and protect our future. Please support the motion. Thank you. Now move to the vote. All those in favour, please show. Thank you. Any against? Any abstentions? Compensate B, public finance and devolved public services is carried. Now move to compensate J, covering motions 42, 43, 44, 45, 47 and 48, public finance and local government cuts, to be moved by Unite. <coughs> Mr President, Congress, Chairman Donald, we have Compensate J, 
cover motions 42 to 48 and public finance and local government cuts. Congress, local government has been under increasing financial pressure over the last decade. Eight consecutive years of a council tax freeze in combination with the real terms reductions in the annual settlements of around 8.5 per cent over the period has led to a significant contraction in local council income. The Scottish Government is starving local authorities of the funds necessary to maintain service provision. Workers are being asked to do more with less and minimal resources in context of major demographical changes, putting an enormous strain on the services. Congress, the facts are that more than 40,000 jobs have been lost, with potentially tens of thousands more to come, as allocations to local authorities have been consistently cut in real terms. This is not a minimal impact, as John Swin Swinney scandalously suggests. Let's be clear, Congress, it's an industrial scale similar to the 1980s under Thatcher. Local government is, in Scotland is facing a crisis, and that's why we urgently need a task force involving unions, COSLA and the Scottish Government to consider the financial situation facing Scotland's local authorities. Sometimes the phrase task force gets branded around too easily, but let's consider the financial debt tsunami facing local authorities. Congress. The Accounts Commission confirms that the liabilities and debts to the Treasury, principally public loan boards, debt stood at £12.1 billion. Scotland's 32 councils also owe £2.35 billion and other high-interest loans known as LOBOs. Taken out of banks such as RBS, which is now publicly owned, by the way, Barclays and overseas lenders such as Franco Bank Dexia. Since 2000, Councils have financed around four billion of the capital projects using PFI and non-profit distributing NDP contracts. Most of the new and refurbished schools under these contracts, councils are committed to paying nearly 17 billion in total. Councils have already paid 3.4 billion and must pay a further 13.4 billion between 2014 and 2042. So, in this context, we must develop a strategy to effectively address the current financial crisis, and a number of options should be taken on, be put on the table Congress. This should include powers to introduce a tourist tax, consideration on how public sector debts such as PFI, PFI can be eliminated or, or, or refinanced, and a greater flexibility for councils in the use of capital budgets. We also like to draw Congress' attention to the Unite Debt Amnesty campaign. As one element of this strategy, the outstanding liabilities of pre-devolution Public Work Loans Board liabilities are estimated to be at £2.45 billion, or on an average of £82 million for each local authority, excluding Shetlands and the Orkneys. What is unique about pre-devolution debt liabilities is that they carry an average interest rate twice that of post-devolution debt, spiking as high as 11 per cent in Aberdeenshire. An amnesty on pre-devolution debt interest repayments would create much-needed breathing space con Congress and extreme pressurised Scottish local government budgets, saving hundreds of millions of pounds and thousands of jobs. We are aware, however, that these recommendations are not on their own a panacea. Rather, we believe that these recommendations should form part of a package of measures to help reform local government finance. Which, local, which Scottish local authorities and the Scottish Government should unite around to protect public sector jobs and services. I ask you to support us composite Congress. Thank you. Can we have Clyde Bank TUC to second the composite? <coughs> President, Congress, Janet Cassidy, Clybank Trade Council, seconded to Composite J. Anybody who did not think austerity was an ideological ways to transfer wealth from the poor to the rich must surely be dissuaded of such a belief since the release of the Panama Papers, which exposed that there is one law for the rich and one law for the rest of us. Those of us who have worked in local government and those of us who rely on its services see it in crisis with thousands of job losses. While Labour and the SNP claim to be anti-austerity parties, both meekly implement Tory cuts with little or, in reality, no resistance. In fact, often they congratulate themselves being able to carry out difficult decisions, whilst at the same time claiming to protect services. 
Clearly, services are not being protected. Rather, our services are being decimated while demand rises and councillors take the easy way out by following the austerity agenda of the small groups of highly paid senior council officers, parroting HR clichés of the need to work differently, the need to work smarter, and where cuts are often carried out under the cover of management adjustments which provide efficiency savings. Our members have suffered years of real-term reduction in wages and intensifying attacks on their terms and conditions. Workers frightened to go sick, using their annual leave with presenteeism commonplace. Staff left behind are subject to restructure fatigue, as this tool is used to spread the workload over fewer workers. As the Composite states, we expect elected members to oppose the austerity agenda, to provide political leadership, leadership fighting the cuts. This indeed would be the difficult option, as it would mean taking on the Scottish and UK governments. But frankly, we are not getting any political leadership at all at local and Scottish level, and there is little sign that will be forthcoming without our movement intensifying the pressure. What is clear is that the organised working class, the trade union movement in alliance with working class communities, and especially our trade union councils, need to politicise the politicians. The composite list measures, which would be central to an anti-cut strategy, but we need to be clear there is no chance of such a strategy being implemented unless we build a mass movement, including direct action to coerce or give confidence to your pick to make councillors adopt such a stand. And we must be honest, we have failed so far to build these local mass movements. The Composite rightly calls for a Scottish-wide conference of local authority trade unions, trade councils and campaign groups. Locally, we have called on local politicians to work with us and call such a summit which could help build for a national conference. However, as of yet, we have had no response. But we do not intend to hold our breath waiting for a call from the local great and good. Rather, we have set ourselves the task of building locally a movement to which local politicians are welcome to get involved in, but if not, accept the consequences. Such local agitation across the country would, we believe, will lay the basis for a successful Scottish-wide conference. As the Panama Papers have proven, there is no need for austerity. There's plenty of money around, it's just not in the wrong hands. I move. I second. Thank you. Can we have Dundee QC? Uh, Conference Chair Stuart Fairweather, Dundee Trade Union Council, supporting Composite J. Uh, Conference, you'll, you'll, you'll not want me to take too long. I suppose or I suspect that everybody is largely supportive of what's in the composite. It calls for three things. It calls for days of action. We need those days of action supported in a wholehearted, vigorous and very real manner. We need that. We need that because we've heard about neoliberalism for the podium. Let's be clear about what neoliberalism is. I guess everybody can, but it's worth restating. It's about putting profit before people. It's about putting pollution before people. It's about putting pornography before people. It's about exploitation in every aspect of our social relations. We need our local government to be something different for that. We need our councillors to stand up against that. We need a sensibility that is overtly anti-racist, a sensibility that's feminist, a sensibility that's for democratic socialism and local government. That was the high point. That was the high point of what we achieved in local government, and that's what we should be going back to, and that's what the composite calls for. Yes, days of action. Yes, a conference. But also saying to those councillors, Tory, Liberal, Independent, we can about them, but also SNP and Labour, you are not a conduit for neoliberal policies. You are not a conduit, and Dundee we would say, tube, but you can what I mean. It's not about handing on like pass the parcel cuts from Osborne to Swinney to local government to working class communities. It's about standing in alliance with communities. Are you councillors for cuts or are you councillors for communities? It's time for change. Next May, let's sort out the councillors, but let's build. Let's build a movement 
that takes back our logo of government, that stands in alliance with communities, that stands in alliance with those that are defending services and works for a different kind of Scotland. Thank you. We have Edinburgh, Edinburgh Trade Union Council. President Deslock, the Edinburgh TUC supporting Composite J. During the past year, Edinburgh TUC has had a number of deputations to the City Council. We have challenged the SNP Labour ruling coalition about their planned cuts. They want to make 2,000 of their employees either voluntarily or compulsorily redundant. Parallel to this, they are making another 2,000 people redundant in the not-for-profit sector. We have asked our councillors, how can they justify sacking 4,000 people together with the associated cuts and services? These politicians could not justify it. They said, don't get angry with us, the Scottish Government is to blame. Their hands were tied by Swinney, they do not have the money. Privately, it is admitted that the Scottish Government could have had the money if they had not foolishly frozen the council tax in 2008. They managed to persuade themselves that it was better for a working class family to save £100 per year even though one of their children had their hours at work cut in half. We asked the council to have the integrity to represent the people of Edinburgh and defy the Scottish Government by putting up the council tax. The council would be defending jobs, they would make compulsory redundancies unnecessary. They would be supported by the working people of Edinburgh. We told them they should not be mindless austerity agents. But the SNP Labour Coalition did not have the bottle or the courage to politically defy the Scottish Government. Congress, deputations and all the lobbying we carried out was not enough to stop compulsory redundancies. We won the debate but could not change things. The movement has to take stronger action to stop compulsory redundancies in any part of Scotland. Whatever Scottish Government is elected on the 5th of May, it does not have a mandate to sack 20,000 people. We need to remind them if, of this by militant action if necessary. Nicola Sturgeon says she believes in fairness at work. She should practice it. Congress support the composite. Thank you. Uh, Faith TUC, please. Tom Kirby, uh, Fife Trade Union Council, supporting Composite J. As we've heard, we've already lost 40,000 public se sector jobs since 2008. It's predicted an at least another 8,000 have to go. Over the years, services have been slashed. We've seen the continual privatisation of all our public services and industries. There's no more room for cuts. We've cut to the bone. It's nothing new, of course. It's part of the Tories' ongoing manufactured austerity ideology and their drive to privatise every single public service in this country. Both the SNP and Labour now agree that austerity is a political choice. It's not a requirement. With both now standing on an anti-austerity platform, all over Scotland people are going to vote for them on that basis. The time for talk is over. It's time to put the rhetoric into action. Talk is cheap. To blame others is even easier. When a service is lost or privatised, when decent public sector jobs are cut, they're never coming back. And they are a political choice, they're not a requirement. That is why we need action now. We can't await some promised utopia of independence or Jeremy Corbyn walking into number 10, neither of which is guaranteed. We are faced now with a political choice of either implementing austerity or resisting it. The Tories are in turmoil. They can be defeated. And still they tell us there's no more money for our public services. But there is always money to give to the privateers. There's money to give to the oil industry. One and a half billion pounds in tax breaks. 500 million pounds in emergency funding. Tax breaks in funding to companies that have raped billions in profits since the 80s. There was enough political will in this country to raise £375 billion to bail out the very people that caused the problems we are now facing. Why is it we are always willing to nationalise the privateer's debt whilst we cut the throat of every public service in our country? 
for our public services, there is never a bailout. There is never a task force. It is always slash, cut and burn. In Fife, we had direct action. We had every postman out in Glenrothes when they were doing the budget in Fife. But we need concerted action. We are calling on all councils, all councillors, no matter what party, if you're anti-austerity, stand up, stand together and resist the cuts. Put aside your party, petty political, eh, and work together. Work together with the trade unions, work together with the trades councils, work together with the People's Assembly as we do in Fife and all our communities to resist the cuts and to project our jobs. That is what we should be demanding for them to make a choice a political choice, a choice that is really anti-austerity, but not just in words, in deeds. I support. Thank you. North Lanarkshire, TUC. President, Congress, uh, Jim Carlin, North Lanarkshire Trades Council, first-time delegate and first-time speaker. Uh, Comrades, brothers and sisters, we ask that this Congress lobby the Scottish Government to reinvest in local authorities to prevent cuts to public services, which will have a devastating consequence to frontline services and be a disaster for the vital services that local government provide. It will hamper future employment opportunities for young and old alike, and through outsourcing will diminish value for money of servicing those in most need. It will drive down wages and through cuts cutting into the Sorry, through costs cutting into the private sector, impact on employee health and safety. All this will have a devastating effect on the local economy through job losses and anticipated changes in pay structure thanks to the Tory 11 wage. We demand that the Scottish Government change its policy on restricting funding for local government services through continued council tax freezes. Comrades, the Scottish Government has a choice to make, and they start acting like an anti austerity government as promised. Do not implement Tory cuts. Make no mistake, brothers and sisters, these Tory cuts are being imposed for ideological reasons and not economic, as they would have you believe. And we can now cite the Panama Papers as further evidence if the proof are needed. Fight for local jobs, fight for a local economy. Support the Compass Act. Thank you. One more speaker. Chair, comrades, Pat Duffy, STU Disabled Workers Committee, and I'm also a member of the GMB. And I support all these motions, comrades. You know, and I don't care what government you've got, whether it's Labour, Tory, SNP, they don't control. They have no control. The people that control us are people like Rockefeller, Rothschild, the capitalist system. Until we change the capitalist system, when the working class get off their knees, then we'll do something. No before it. Now move to the vote. All those in favour, please show. Thank you. Any against? Any abstentions? Compensate Jai. Public finance and local government cuts is carried. <coughs> Congress will now move to uh, take emergency motion four, PFI, PP, PPP, and emergency, emergency motion fourteen, City of Edinburgh Council, PPP crisis in a block debate. Uh, I'll call emergency motion four and then we'll call for a seconder. We have EIS to move emergency motion four. Thanks, President Congress. I just thought I'd come down here and make sure you were awake so that I'm up and down. Uh, the last debate we've just had uh, on Composite J dealt with uh, P PFI, PPP, in terms of the money. This emergency motion is brought to you because of the situation that we are facing in our schools in Edinburgh as I speak. For those of you who watched Breakfast News this morning uh, and for the last two or three weeks, it has been the leading item on the news because it is unprecedented that 17 schools in one local authority have had it to be closed due to health and safety issues. Schools have been being built across Scotland for hundreds of years, uh, and that has never happened. These schools, some of them have reopened, some of them may be closed for a further few weeks, some of them may even be closed for a further few months. Just at the point when 
secondary school students are facing exams, just at the point when we are continually told uh, about the problems with raising attainment. We are facing disruption in Edinburgh for our youngsters that we have never faced before. And why is that? It's because 10 years ago, and these schools are only 10 years old, 10 years ago they were built through a public finance initiative. Now we are not saying, and I think we need to be quite clear here, we are not saying that it was simply because they were built through a public finance initiative that the, the problem has arisen. But what we are saying is that there has not been enough monitoring of what has been going on in the schools. We are told that the construction company, not the council, signed off these buildings. But this does raise significant questions, such significant questions that the Scottish Government, the day after this happened, actually wrote to all local authorities who had been using that particular construction company and asked them to do health and safety checks there. Such significant questions that we need to really think about. Things have changed. Austerity is here. Has that had an impact? on maintenance contracts? Has that had, had an impact on safety monitoring? We know that concerns, particularly in Edinburgh, were raised a number of months ago. The situation at Oxgangs actually happened in January. There are more questions than answers at the moment, which is why we are asking for, or we are supporting, sorry, the call for an independent inquiry into the specific circumstances in Edinburgh. But we also think there should be a broader look at the value for money through PFI. One of the speakers in the last debate talked about uh, actually looking at the cost to the public purse of PFI, and we think that that should happen as well. I move. Thank you. Do we have a seconder, please? Congress, Susan Kennedy Unison, seconding this emergency motion. Congress, we all recognise that the issues raised around PPP by what has happened in Edinburgh go well beyond a single project and call into question this whole funding model as it has been used from its inception to present and plans to continue using it in the future. PFI, PPP, NPD. They are all different names for all the same problem. They are all flawed and we need them all investigated. We need them all to be made transparent and need to explore ways of bringing them back in-house. Unison has been one of the strongest campaigners against PPP PFI and we have raised concerns for many years about the disastrously costly mistakes of using it for schools, hospitals and other public infrastructure. Congress, conventional funding makes sense. PPP PFI has been eye-wateringly expensive, with secretive contracts that have been acknowledged now by so many as being a rip-off. At a time now of austerity, where local government budgets are being sliced and education has no protection from these cuts. The ongoing costs of schools and other contracts are having a major impact. We need to act now. We want the next Scottish Government to commission an inquiry into all public-private partnership infrastructure projects in Scotland. This inquiry would include within its remit what can be done to open up the contracts and charging regimes to public scrutiny and to examine the opportunity of historic low borrowing rates on capital to refinance or bring back these schemes into the public sector to provide better value for money. We must therefore say to the First Minister don't just investigate the schemes that suit you, Nicola. We need you to look at all of them for all of our children's safety and all of our safety within the public sector. Please support. Thank you. Congress will now move to the vote. No. Oh, we're moving. Moving oh, we're moving. Oh. Sorry, moving.
Emergency motion 14, um, NASUWT to move. Well done. President, Congress, Jane Peckham, NASUWT. Moving emergency motion 14 and thanking previous colleagues for emergency motion 4. Um, in looking at the crisis this week, past couple of weeks, we have to um, bring quite a lot into consideration. We have to recognise that the Council did react very quickly, but in doing so, that's actually created even further issues that I think it might be useful to highlight some of the detail to Congress today. As we know, the contingency plans have been put in place for many of the affected pupils. One of the mistakes that the NESUWT feels was made was the Council actually promised parents that they would have their children taught by their specific class teacher. And when you have a scenario where you have fourth to sixth years in one place and first to third years moving to an alternative place, you cannot split the workforce into teaching their specific classes in two different locations. In arranging the accommodation, there are some questions raised around one in particular where there was a, 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 an emergency meeting held to increase the capacity of a specific secondary school to allow it to um, take in uh, 560 extra pupils from one of the most affected schools. And, and questions have to be raised as to whether that can actually be done in such a short space of time. In terms of impact on the teaching staff, um, there have been huge issues with teachers being asked to go into workplaces which have been declared unsafe, yet safe enough to be given hard hats and high-vis jackets to go in and identify the resources that they need to take forward to teach the um, pupils who are facing exams, but also not just identifying the resources, but loading them into their own cars and transporting them from one workplace to another. And this is clearly not acceptable. Um, there should have been plans in place for the Council to move any uh, resources that were required. In terms of travel, children were issued with bus tokens, and we know that the bus companies have been immensely helpful in putting on extra buses, in extra policing, and so on. But it's just not acceptable that transport wasn't arranged for these pupils in the first place. Much is being made of how there won't be lasting impact on the pupils. Now, these children are sitting their national exams, their national qualifications, and yes, we um, appreciate the fact that delays have been put in place to practical exams, but no recognition of the stress on the pupils from having to suddenly undertake a dance exam, for example, in a completely different space that they're not prepared to do. Also, the effect on children who have additional support needs, children who are autistic or who have Downs, for instance, who are suddenly landed in a completely different env environment to the one that they're normally used to. So I cannot understand why there will be no lasting impact on the pupils. In terms of the safety checks, and I think the previous uh, speakers highlighted a lot of this as well, if you have a scenario where a school has had holes drilled in a wall four weeks ago and pronounced to be safe and yet two weeks later is closed, then you have to question the integrity of the safety checks that were ongoing previous to this crisis. And that's why we're calling for safety checks to be undertaken urgently across the whole of this country to make sure that every building our children are entering and our workers is safe for them to do so. Staff have been put in an untenable position. They've gone above and beyond their normal duties in order to help and to reassure the pupils that they teach. But in doing so, they've been putting themselves into unsafe positions, and that's unacceptable. The additional costs of moving to a different workplace are not being taken into consideration either. They're not adjusting or didn't adjust the length of the school day, for instance, to accommodate the move from one school to another. Um, so we need to ensure that our uh, members are supported in that. And the, over the overarching effect of all of this will be the stress. The stress on teachers who are really, really concerned about supporting their pupils through this, about delivering education in, frankly, ridiculous scenarios, and the fact that there is no information as to how long this will continue for. So we are asking that um, this is looked at in much more detail, that any future plans are assessed to ensure that they are safe and that they are 
uh, quality impact assessed and that children are given the opportunity to proceed with their exams without there being any lasting impact on their future life chances. Thank you. I move. Thank you. I think we have one speaker. Yes. Congress says Lockney, Edinburgh TUC, seconding emergency motion number 14. I really felt I ought to speak in order to um, relay some of the problems that are facing parents in, Ed in Edinburgh, the detriment that is facing parents. When this crisis broke, um, we got phone calls from trade union members who are parents saying, you know, what are our rights if we suddenly have to take time off work? Do we get paid? And what happens to childcare costs? Well, we were able to advise them that um, it would be treated as a domestic emergency, that they had a right to take time off, but they didn't have a right to be paid. And um, so far, no one has said that the, um, anyone has any liability for parents who have had to take time off work, even though they have lost some of them at least a week's wages and perhaps more. That has not been raised in the media by anyone, including the educational trade unions. We've all, they've also um, feel that their, kit, that their extra childcare expenses should be, should be covered, and that has been raised by some organisations with the City Council, and the City Council has said that they're going to claim off the contractors for childcare expenses, and maybe that will be paid, but it's not guaranteed. I think now the whole movement, the STUC, all the unions involved, should insist that the City Council pays for loss of wages as a result of this crisis and also pays for all childcare expenses. And if they can't cover the costs, I know it will be difficult, the cuts that they're trying to implement, and either the Scottish Government should pay for these costs as well as the actual cost of repair, or the contractors should pay for the costs. Please, Congress support this emergency motion. Congress will now move to the vote on emergency motion four. All those in favour, please show. Thank you. Any against? Any abstentions? That's carried. Now move to the, the vote on emergency motion 14. All those in favour? Any against? Any abstentions? Emergency motion 14 is carried. Now move to uh, emergency motion 13, Karen Phoenix Falkirk, and can GMB Scotland come down to move it? Congress President Charlie Robertson, GMB Scotland, moving emergency motion 13. Congress Karen Phoenix has been a feature in Falkirk for over 250 years. It's famed for making the cannons used by Wellington at Waterloo and also the Royal Mail's famous red boxes and post boxes, along with the iron casings uh, which line the Clyde Tunnel. Locals fondly remember the plant being well over five miles long. Congress, within 18 months, this great plant will be confined to the history books unless we stand together and fight this decision. GMB Scotland calls on the Scottish Government uh, for immediate intervention to save over two centuries of skilled manufacturing. This despite a full order book extorting all over the world. This move has devastated the workforce and some of the shop sewers will be in Dundee later today, hopefully to meet the First Minister. As discussed yesterday, manufacturing in Scotland is on the verge of extinction. GMB Scotland calls upon Congress to do everything possible to save this plant and the jobs of the stewards and the men in it. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate. Do we have, do we have a seconder? Formally? Thank you. Any contributions? Okay, we'll move to the vote. All those in favour, please show. Thank you. Any against? Any abstentions? That's carried.
Congress, I'd now like to introduce uh, Davina Rankin, Chair of the STUC Women's Committee. Davina has been an active uh, member of Unison since she joined in 1999. She became a shop steward at the University of Glasgow. She is currently the branch secretary of Glasgow Caledonian University branch, where she is the lead local Unison negotiator and non-academic staff convener and holds a number of positions in Unison, including as an elected member of their National Executive Council and National Higher Education Executive Council. Davina was elected to the STUC Women's Committee in 2010 and is currently chair in campaigns to highlight the double discrimination faced by black women in the workplace and society. Davina, please address Congress. I can't see if that's all. Thank you, President, Congress. Good morning. I bring with me sorrow, greetings, and warmest wishes from the STC Women's Committee. Yesterday, as I watched the news on TV, my hat sank as George Osborne bounded onto the screen. Now, to be fair, my heart always sinks when I see George Osborne. But yesterday, he was campaigning on the EU referendum, claiming that a Brexit would cost every household an average of £4,300. I was infuriated by the breathtaking hypocrisy of the Chancellor, the man who has taken public spending back to the 1950s. We know he has adopted the phrase, women and children first, as we have been forced to pay the price for bailing out the bankers. Since 2010, 86% of all of the austerity measures have been funded by women and children. In total, the Women's Budget Group predict that between 2010 and 2020, single mothers will be over £6,000 worse off, the hardest hit group in society and the ones who are least able to afford to bail out the bankers. The effect of the Osborne's failed fiscal policy is that there will be an additional 800,000 children and an additional 1.5 million working age adults living in poverty. His plan A has failed. The economy is stagnating, inequality is growing and he has yet to learn that when plan A fails the alphabet has 25 other letters and it is time to move on. Unfortunately, Osborne seems to care more about his chances of moving into number 10 than actually dealing with the growing inequality in Britain that he has caused. His ideological attack on the public sector and the welfare state has led to a, a growing level of in-work poverty, where food banks are spreading throughout the UK, where families make the difficult choice of feeding their children or heating their homes, where zero-hour contracts, underemployment and low wages see workers being forced to work longer hours just to make ends meet. And to top it all off, in an effort to show that he was really a friend of the worker, he has introduced an age-differentiated rebranded minimum wage and had the audacity to call it the living wage. As you heard yesterday, we are now seeing some employers jump on this bandwagon by either removing um, in-work benefits or by abandoning the real living wage. The one remaining barrier to Osborne is the trade union movement, and we have provided a last line of resistance. His climb down over tax credits was a direct result of some nifty organising and lobbying by the trade unions, and I am proud that my union, Unison, was at the forefront of that work. So instead of embracing the trade union movement and learning from their past mistakes, and past defeats, the Westminster Government has launched a full frontal assault in the shape of the Trade Union Bill. Today is an important day in the passage of that bill as it returns to the Lords for a reading on DOCAS, or Chekhov as it is also known. The Tories have suffered many defeats in the Lords over the bill and hopefully today we will see yet another defeat as there is an amendment being laid down by a Tory peer which seeks to lessen the impact of the attack on DOCAS. There is still work to be done and it is important that we continue to lobby our MPs and peers. It is also important that we lobby our MSPs and remind them that the Scottish Government must refuse to implement any of this horrendous trade union bill if it is passed. They must instead focus on the findings of the Fair Work Convention. As the Scottish Parliament gains more powers, they must use them to refer to damaging cuts to our public sector and welfare state. 
Over the years, we have heard Scottish politicians say that if only they had the power, they would do something completely different to Westminster. Well, they have been gaining increasing power, and as someone once said, with great powers comes great responsibilities, and it is time those powers are used to ensure we have progressive policies in Scotland. To be fair, the Scottish Government have adopted different approaches, and the ongoing steel crisis shows the difference between Scotland and the rest of the UK. But at a time when we have a Tory Government that slashes harder and faster than anything Thatcher could have dreamt of, we need a Scottish Government that is bold and daring and is willing to put their kind, warm words into action instead of wringing their hands and blaming Westminster. There is very little point in having additional powers if all we, that happens is we see Tory light agenda or as we have seen in terms of local government funding, a Tory plus agenda. And it's shameful that the current Scottish Government have opted not only to pass on the cuts, but have increased the level of funding cuts to local government, resulting in 40,000 job losses, with services either stopped or dramatically reduced. As always, women bear the brunt of the cuts, as we are more likely to be providing the public services, as well as accessing them more frequently. Unsurprisingly, as women bear the brunt of the austerity measures, the Women's Committee have been busy, and I want to highlight a couple of the areas that the Women's Committee have been focusing on. The Women in Work project has been funded by the Scottish Government and carried out by a researcher named Alexandra Webb at the STUC. Her research looked at women in the workplace and the role of women in the trade union movement. It was the first time we'd seen this level of um, analysis carried out in Scotland. Our findings will be launched at an event on the 29th of April and details can be found on, at our stall at the corridor at the back of the hall. Please pick up a leaflet on your way past. Some lessons learned from that research included the need to improve our collection and monitoring systems to make access to this of type of data easier in future. And we also need to make sure that we support and mentor the next generation of female trade union activists to make sure that they are not forced to relearn the lessons we have learned the hard way and instead can focus on fighting new battles. The committee have also focused on abortion rights and the run-up to the responsibility for legislation passing to the Scottish Parliament. The ability to control your own reproductive health and decide when or even if you have children is key to achieving equality for women. Access to safe and easily accessible services is a class issue. It has been and will always be easier for the well-off to access birth control and, when necessary, abortion services. It is something that is constantly under attack, whether it be from politicians such as Donald Trump or from movements like 40 Days for Life or Abort 67. And the fact that the 1967 Abortion Act was never implemented in Northern Ireland means that the UK justice system still criminalises women, which means there is still much work for the trade union movement to do. Our work plan also includes activities on violence against women, older women in the workplace, women in transport, increasing women's membership in trade unions and our participation in public and political life at all levels, ha free high quality universal childcare that is publicly funded and publicly provided and this year we will be looking to increase the level of joint work across the SDC Equalities Committees and last night we held a fantastic French meeting which will hopefully mark the start of that work. I have highlighted only but a small fraction of our workload and more details can be found on the SCC Women's Committee Facebook page and the SCC website, which includes a health and safety toolkit we have developed that focuses on women in the workplace. So in conclusion, a wise woman once said that a strong woman is a woman determined to do something others are determined not be done. It is a saying that I truly believe reflects SDC's Women's Committee as we have determined to make a real change for women wherever they live. And I look forward to working with the rest of the SDC over the remaining year of my, my chair. So thank you very much for listening and I wish you a successful Congress. Davina, uh, on behalf of General Council and uh, Congress, can I thank you very much for that address and can I offer you this small token of our appreciation? Thank you. <laughs> Congress will now move to motion 46, tax the rich and defend council jobs and services to be moved by Cumbernauld and Colsyth Trade Union Council.
אז אין לו הור. נו. רק פורס. Now call compensate you covering motions 49 and 50, campaigning for public services against the pay cap and HMRC closures to be moved by PCS. Chair Conference, Cheryl Gedling, PCS Union, moving compensate you um, on office closures, HMRC office closures and public sector pay cuts. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation in um, a Scotland Without Poverty report published recently said that poverty is costly, risky and wasteful for the economy and society. But more than that, it's a personal tragedy for all of our members affected by it. We know the scale of the unprecedented attacks that we face, 11 years of pay restraint in the civil service, pension contributions increased year on year, national insurance contribution increases of 1% hitting pay packets in two weeks' time and a freeze now in tax credits, which up to 40% of PCS members have to claim because of chronic low pay, means that the working poor will be driven into abject poverty. And a 1% pay cap, the same by the way, whether it's delivered by Swinney or Osborne, is having a tremendous effect on our members and it's causing peer misery for us all. We got individual testimonies from PCS members in Scotland last year. Stories of payday loans, of visits to food banks, of a daily struggle to make ends meet, pay bills and put food on the table. Stories of misery and despair. Some of these in the Scottish Government itself, by the way, who has the brass neck to call itself an exemplar employer. And why? It hasn't worked. The deficit that was supposed to be eradicated is still 90 billion. The debt that Osborne said would be 67% of GDP is 80% of GDP. And the only people that are still doing well are those at the top. The richest 1% or so have continued to do very well, helped by Osborne cutting the 50% tax rate to 45%. Panama, the British Virgin Islands, the Cayman Islands, Bermuda, Switzerland, not the cheery words of a Beach Boys song, but the top UK tax avoidance hotspots. As Richard Murphy of the research, um, Tax Research UK, who's done lots of work with my union on our tax justice campaign, says, imagine what we could do with £119 billion of avoided and evaded tax if only this was collected. But all we can do is imagine, because the Bullingdon boys have no intention of closing the tax gap and collecting this money. And in fact, they're making it easier to avoid and evade tax. We know this because in 2005, the tax collecting department, HMRC, employed 105,000 staff. In 2016, it employs 58,000 staff. On the 12th of November last year, they published a plan for the future, ironically called Building Our Future, which includes the closure of 90% of tax offices across Scotland and the UK and large staffing reductions. They're proposing 8,000 further job cuts and staff being based in 13 regional centres, two of these in Scotland and Edinburgh and Glasgow, and four specialist sites, which means a massive loss of jobs right across Scotland for us. On the 16th of February, HMRC issued compulsory redundancy notice to 152 members of staff, most of whom are PCS members, and that's the biggest number of compulsory redundancy notices issued in a single instance by any UK civil service department. We believe that they're sending a signal about exactly how they're going to go about the mass office closure programme arising from the Building Our Future plan. And it's no coincidence they're announcing a cut in our redundancy payments at the same time as they're announcing these job closures. We believe that Building Our Future should be placed on hold to allow for full parliamentary and public scrutiny, for a proper assessment by the National Audit Office of the full costs of the proposals and the impact of the effectiveness of HMRC's ability to collect tax and enforce tax compliance. HMRC are currently refusing to do this, but our members are campaigning and fighting hard to deliver this. And I want to pay tribute to some of those members who are here today, working in really difficult circumstances to do a good job, to collect the tax that we need to keep our public services, when morale has never been lower, fighting not just to save their jobs, but also for the future of the communities that they live and work in, who will be destroyed by this office, office closure programme. And we see in this, in the Panama Papers, the sickness and the corruption at the heart of the Westminster Government. The Tories are presiding over the biggest transfer of wealth from us and our class to the wealthy few that any of us have seen in our lifetimes. The disabled and the ill are being denied the benefits, while tax breaks are being given to the super rich, and one million rely on food banks. Conference, how much worse does it have to get? 
In announcing the biggest number of compulsory redundancies in any UK civil service department, they have put a marker down to us, and it is about time we put a marker down to them. We need to take them on. We need mass coordinated demonstrations, mass coordinated strike action with common demands. This is the only way we are going to persuade Osborne and his cronies to lift the pay cap. It is the only way we are going to win fair pay increases for our members. The only way we are going to defend our pensions, our jobs and our services. If not now, conference when? Support the Composite. Aberdeen QC to second the Composite. President, Congress, Kate Ramsden, Aberdeen TUC, second in this composite with particular reference to the HMRC closures. On 12 November, just after they celebrated their 10th birthday, which senior management may have celebrated but none of the staff did, HMRC announced a cut from 170 to just 17 offices by 2026. In Scotland, it is planned, as you have heard, to have only three locations in Edinburgh, Glasgow and one at Gart Kosh. 18 locations will close across Scotland with the loss of over 2,500 jobs. This is on top of other closures that saw all 281 HMRC public inquiry centres close in 2014. Since 2010, 10,000 staff have lost their jobs in HMRC and many more have left of their own accord without being replaced because of the worsening terms and conditions. Tory austerity measures have done nothing to close the tax gap, which continues to stand at over £120 billion per year, yet they still pursue benefit claimants for just over £1 billion. Their priorities are all wrong and their motives are disturbing. HMRC can't possibly hope to make inroads into the tax gap as staffing levels continue to fall. As jobs are lost from Scottish local communities, so does thousands of years of tax experience that will take decades to replace in the current region in the regional centres. Staff outside of the central belt, including staff in the North East, our part of the world, are almost certainly faced with redundancy, which the government fully appreciates, so it is now consulting on new terms that will allow them to get rid of thousands of staff on the cheap. HMRC claims that its digital plans for the future will mean that there will be no detriment to tax collection after moves to the regional centres. When was the last time that someone paid their tax bill solely because a computer told them to? It's hard enough to get the rich to pay their tax bill at any time. It's already very difficult to speak to a real person in HMRC. By 2026, the internet will be the only way you can contact them. HMRC continued to be dedicated to serving the public and policing tax systems, despite pay freezes, pension cuts, reduced terms and conditions and a desperate performance management system that sees a mandatory 10 per cent of staff receiving a must-improve marking, even if every member of staff achieves their objectives for the year. It is a hideous way to work. Morale is at an all-time low, and very soon thousands of Scottish and UK public servants will be out of work. All of us here must do everything we can to reverse this madness. We join the PCS in calling on the General Council to campaign to overturn the decision to close these offices before the first closures begin in 2017, to highlight the impact of these closures to the public and to oppose the blatant austerity-led agenda of this Tory government. Please support this motion. Thank you very much. We will move to the vote. All those in favour, please show. Thank you. Any against? Abstentions? That's Composite U campaigning for public services against pay, cap and HMRC closures is carried. We will now continue with motions on public services, section 5 of the agenda. Uh, motion 51, safe operating solutions to be moved by community. President, Congress, Tiffany Gillis, Community Moving Motion 51, Safe Operating Solutions. Congress, I work in Her Majesty's Prison, Kilmarnock, and I'm a proud member of the Justice Sector Union community. I have first-hand experience 
of the difficult circumstances our members face on a daily basis. The cost-driven procurement process undertaken by both Scottish and UK governments means that our members are often exposed to dangerous situations. Situations with straightforward solutions which are easily avoided, but instead the government have chosen to cut the prison's budget by another £9 million on day-to-day -day spending this year. Let me tell you what budget cuts means on the front line for prison officers. It means one officer working alone with 60-plus prisoners. It means slower response times to emergency situations, high levels of staff fatigue and an increase of suicide attempts and assaults. In most jobs, long hours or understaffing might seem challenging, but in this job, the impact is much starker. Scottish Government data shows that the number of serious assaults on staff is at an all-time high since this Government took, play, took, took office in 2007. The number of sexual assaults on staff by prisoners has steadily increased over the last five years. Absences due to st stress-related illnesses have increased by 19% in one year. That is why my union community has developed a Safe Operating Solutions Charter, a set of minimum safety standards which aims to establish common standards that both government and private companies competing for justice service contracts can adopt. Community is calling for policies that significantly reduce violence and provide proper aftercare to all staff agreed staffing levels and an end to loan working culture, commitments to improve health and, health and safety delivery, consistent and effective training for all employees, and positive partnerships with community groups which will help to reduce reoffending. We want employers, whether that is a private company or the Scottish Prison Service, to protect employees and sign up to this campaign. And we want the government to commit to these minimum safety standards for all who work in the justice sector. We have already successfully launched this campaign in Holyrood and at Westminster, securing backing from politicians and employers. And we hope that colleagues present today will also support the fight, our fight for better working conditions for all prison staff. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have a seconder? Yep. President, Congress, Stephen Thompson, Fire Brigade Union, seconding motion 51, safe operating solutions. The Fire Brigade Union identify and empathise with the ongoing challenges facing frontline staff in critical roles, such as those in the prison service. Firefighters and prison officers are both uniformed and disciplined services, and the nature of our professions means we both face inherent dangers doing our jobs. One way to reduce the risk we face is to ensure appropriate number of staff are on duty and working to consistently apply safe working practices to deliver the safest working environments possible. We do, however, recognise that many of the, the jobs we're talking about have been privatised, and we cannot support that. We would support all of these jobs have moved back into the public, public sector. However, we do also recognise all of these workers must remain safe. Please support this motion, which calls for common standards to be adopted by all those working in the justice and custodial sector to help end unsafe working practices in all frontline second services. I second. Thank you. Are there any speakers? Thanks, President. Congress full fairly, Prison Officers Association. There are several apologies to the community. Um, there are several things about this motion that are concerned, in particular the action it calls for, which we think should be a concern to everyone here. And it's for that reason we're asking Congress to reject it. There are 15 prisons here in Scotland, 13 of which are in the public sector. 
The POA are the only recognised trade union for prison officers in those jails, with community having recognition rights in the two private. It is worth pointing out just now that we only have two private prisons due to the present Scottish Government intervening when they came to office stopping a process put in place by the previous administration that was about to hand the contract for HMP Low Moss to the private sector and instead give it to the public sector to run. The importance of that point is central to the stance that we are asking you to take in relation to this motion. For those of you who have a little knowledge of our prisons, you could be forgiven for thinking that there is little difference between what happens in our public and private due to the way the information being presented is a conflation of both, as if somehow they were one and the same. The wording of the motion and the charter that this motion asks us to back paints a picture of our prisons in a state of near crisis, grossly understaffed, overcrowded and so unsafe that staff fear coming through the doors each morning. Congress, I can assure you that if that were the case, it would be the POA coming to this podium demanding support and action to tackle that circumstance. But it is simply not the position we are facing in the public sector prisons. In a motion to Congress, it does not adequately seek to differentiate between public and private, does a disservice to the staff inside both. Our prisons are not without their problems, but we are not understaffed. Our numbers have grown over year, year by year with the new additions to the prisons estate, and despite the £9 million cuts referred to, that budget um, has been taken from non-frontline operational numbers which have been protected by following representations made by this trade union. Nor are we overcrowded. Today, some of our prison numbers have never been lower. And while we would agree wholeheartedly with the sentiment that we send far too many people to prison, our objection is not that we are overcrowded, but that we have been asked to watch over and keep safe people who are better managed away from a custodial setting. Congress, we cannot speak on behalf of the custody officers who work in the private prisons in Scotland, and nor do I seek to. If the picture painted by the moving union to this motion is the reality of private prisons, I can say here and now that they have the full support and solidarity of the POA. Nobody should be going to their work in those conditions feeling that way, not even if the workplace is a prison. But this is the crux of why we cannot support this motion and urge Congress to think very carefully. Right now we have a Scottish Government who ideologically and fundamentally oppose private prisons and have done so since the day they came into office, not just in their words but by their actions. Why then would Congress support a motion that by its very nature seeks to steer us on a path that accepts further privatisation as inevitable? and have us adopt a charter to be used in negotiations with future private companies looking to line their pockets with more of the public sector purse. Congress, I do not dispute for a minute what has been claimed here about the conditions of pressures inside the private prisons. It is what we said would happen when previous governments, both Labour and Tory, went down this road. That being the case, the only motion that should have been brought to this Congress was one calling on the Scottish Government to end those private contracts, take the two prisons back into public hands and have them managed and staffed properly. You wind up, Delegate, please. Just a bit. I believe a motion such as that would have been given unanimous support and we would have stood here shoulder to shoulder with you on that call. To ask us to instead support a motion that seeks to simply influence negotiations, a future privatisation of our prisons in this country, both misses the point of the debate and comes up with entirely the wrong solution. Congress, we would urge you to reject this motion. Does community want the right to reply? No. Okay. We'll move to the vote. All those in favour, please show. All those against? Any abstentions? <laughs> That's lost. Yeah. Motion 51, Safe Operating Solutions, is lost. Congress, this morning we passed an emergency motion 13 supporting workers at Karen Phoenix Falkirk. Congress, I'm delighted to welcome Karen Phoenix workers who have joined us in the hall. Sitting over there. <laughs> the workers will meet. Uh, <clears throat> First Minister Nicola Sturgeon during her visit to Congress in a meeting arranged by the STUC. Uh, I can assure all the workers at Carn Phoenix that you have the full support of Congress and the trade union movement in Scotland to fight for your jobs. <laughs> now call amended motion 52, housing, to be moved by CWU.
Thank you, President. Congress, uh, Motion 52, Ronnie Pollock of the Communications Workers Union. This is about poor quality and expensive housing is a fact of life for many Scottish people. It is a disgrace that many, for years, have different governments have failed to act on this. In June 2015, the Commission on Wellbeing and Housing published its report, A Blueprint for Scotland's Bright Future. This report focused on tackling Scotland's housing problems through a range of measures, including building 23,000 new homes a year, changing taxation on housing and encouraging energy efficient housing. This backs up what Shelter Scotland have released as part of their manifesto for homes ahead, for homes ahead and up and coming holiday elections, including but not exclusively the following. One, delivering a home for everybody, building at least 12,000 affordable homes, affordable rentable homes, sorry, each year, with most of them being in socially rented homes, including housing associations. To putting homes at the heart of social justice, tackling child poverty, the abolition of the bedroom tax, and ensuring that information and support is there for all tenants. And three, making private rent and right and affordable. Given that private renting has more than doubled in the last 10 years, we need support for tenants against bad landlords. And given what we've heard already in this hall, in light of the low wages, and how many people are on zero-hour contracts, we need affordable housing for everybody. These pledges are necessary to end the housing crisis, bring, the misery to thousands, bring an end to the misery of thousands of householders across Scotland and help bring them out of the fuel poverty that so many face today. Congress, please support this motion I move. Thank you. Can I have you cat to second? President, Congress, Graham Farker, UCAT, seconding amended motion 52. Congress, the drive towards private ownership of housing and housing is seen as a commodity has left Scotland with woefully inadequate numbers of houses for public rent. Our history has seen millions of council homes sold off and our communities devastated with lack of investment. Yet, yet rather than the political parties in power in Scotland responding to this crisis and building the decent council and social homes we need, they have failed to make serious inroads into changing the housing landscape in Scotland. Without writing off figures, the investment in public housing and development of new social housing has been woeful. Nowhere near enough. Congress, my union represents workers in the construction industry, including building workers engaged in the maintenance of council and social homes. Our jobs have been outsourced as homes are sold off and the councils lost responsibility for housing. Now we are at further risk as cuts to local government finances bite. Many councils seeking to re reduce its housing maintenance staff. Because the number of housing and public ownership has been hammered down, this will impact on the jobs, on skills and opportunities for the younger generation and apprenticeships. And there's just no need for this. Scotland, ne Scotland needs new build public housing, not for ownership, but for rent. Not for private landlords to hive off and use as e easy profit. In Scotland, we must oppose the marketising and privatisation of our housing estates. There's always a policy to support those wishing to buy. What is really needed is a review of how we finance and build public housing. And while pre-election manifestos mention affordable housing, affordable to who? The managers, people living at minimum wage? Affordable is not the same as public housing. These affordable homes are often for sale, not for rent. Labour is at least promising 45,000 of the 60,000 new homes built will be for social rent. But more much, much need, needs to be done. Parties should be tested and all they spend the finance available to them. All they support those in need. We need public housing to be top priority, rebuilding communities, directly employed building workers. <laughs> we all know the Conservatives couldn't care less about council, council housing, couldn't care less about hard-working tenants seeking to get on in life. But we expect more of the parties we could claim to be working for the people of Scotland. So we must challenge them on the level of support for public housing, work together with housing charities and campaigning organisations to oppose the narrow policies which are deemed doomed to fail. Politicians are good at the buzzwords like social housing, affordable housing. 
And what about going back to the future and learning two new buzzwords, council housing. And council housing should deliver the massive numbers needed of a good standard at fair price for all. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate. To another GMB. President, Congress, Jim Cunningham, GMB Scotland, supporting motion 52. Colleagues, the private rental sector is booming. Why is that? Is it because they offer better quality housing? Are they better value for money? Do they offer stability? No, colleagues. They are booming because of the lack of social housing and the disgraceful amount of council houses built in the last 30 years. The balance of power between private landlords and private, private tenants sorry, and private landlords has favoured far too much towards the landlords. Our members need better protection if they rent their homes. We fight for better rights at work, but if their home is unfit for purpose or driving members to the brink of bankruptcy, then we must do more. These members are fearful to raise complaints with these landlords for fear of eviction or rent increases. GMB Scotland recently affiliated to the Living Rent Campaign and they are a grassroots campaign set to fight for tenants' rights. We support this motion to build more social housing, to deal with demand, but get more done to protect private sector tenants. Please support. Thank you. I'm now going to move to the vote. Right, we've got time. Okay. President Congress, Mark Ferguson supporting amended motion 52 on housing. It's a national scandal that estimates show there are over 150,000 application housing waiting lists in Scotland, 30% higher than 2004. We have become so obsessed as a nation with home ownership and how much our properties are worth, forgetting how essential they are to our well-being. Motions calling for more social and mixed tenure housing have been submitted to Congress year after year. We must use the Scottish Parliament elections and beyond to demand an end to the crisis by calling for radical housing building programmes that create construction jobs and apprenticeships. Shelters estimated that we need to build 12, at least 12,000 affordable homes each year to meet the current and future need. Unison Scotland believes that unit housing has been left to the market for too long. The market has failed to deliver. The private owned and private rented sectors cannot, cannot address the shortage. Unison's policy, a paper making homes fairer for Scotland, outlined a new housing programme that we showed how this could be funded. Using some of the assets represented by public sector pension funds, set out in our document funding and building the home Scotland needs. At a recent Unison Local Government conference, we heard how some councils are prioritising homeless applications based on income, mainstreaming homelessness. Who could have thought it in our own doorsteps? Successive governments have failed to adequately address our housing shortage, and we cannot afford more excuses. There has been a significant rise in private tenancies in recent years, Whilst we recognise the Scottish Government has made some progress to protect these tenancies, much more needs to be done. This motion calls for rent controls, high housing standards and enforcement powers. I will leave you this thought. Unison Scottish Young Members ran a campaign, Gears a House, which highlighted the added unfairness for young people. So if this crisis isn't addressed, parents could have their children staying with them for many, many more years. So that's worth campaigning for. Thank you very much, Congress. Please support. OK, Congress, we will now move to the vote. All those in favour, please show. Thank you. Any against? Any abstentions? Motion 52 is carried. Now call on Motion 53, Prison Services, to be moved by North Lanarkshire TUC. If there is anybody wishing to speak on that, can you come down to the... Left hand side, right hand side for use. <coughs> Congress, John Stark, moving motion 53 in prisons, but more specifically about the controls of our justice system. Privatisation is the scourge of modern political economy. It has been an integral part of the neoliberal project. 
that has dominated government policy. It is part of, a, of driving the market deep into spheres of our society, previously insulated from business. It is centrally about private firms, their owners and their senior managers profiting from services that should be provided publicly on the basis of need. Congress, is there no limits to privatisation? The majority of people in our society are unaware of the creeping influence that private companies uh, 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 and, and their owners have in the provision of security services and support services involved in the protection of citizens of Scotland and the United Kingdom. It is not just that we are against privatisation, but we have a positive alternative to privatisation, public ownership and democratic control. The concern that North Lanarkshire TUC has is not based on experiences of working directly in the many services that protect people and society in the criminal justice and national security system. Congress, over my life, I have seen security move from a night watchman job, a man with a big Alsatian dug looking after a building, a building site, a bouncer at a dance hall, usually some, somebody who could fight or or came from a named family, a guy who was a steward at a football match, a parking attendant with a local authority, cameraman looking after some surveillance cameras in the town centre. Sure, security has become a multi-million pound industry. Many of those families who, uh, who run security services where, where the roots of their business was their family, understood crime, police, prisons and courts. The privatisation business model clicks in, one named family becomes merged with another, business expands and further mergers create bigger national businesses, ultimately international companies who own and influence our, our criminal justice system. <coughs> prisons, the population uh, uh, of prisons in the UK is, is 15 per cent. In the USA, where we tend to think everyone's private order, it's only 9 per cent. So there's something massively happening in, in, in the UK, and we need to uh, uh, be aware of it. Labour, a Labour cabinet, cabinet minister says it would be morally repugnant to treat the incarceration of prisoners as a cash cow uh, to bulk profits. Our probation services, the same private companies are, lo are looking to run private probation services that, uh, that play a vital uh, role in helping offenders manage their transition between serving a custodial sentence and readapting to life in the outside world. Congress, while attending Unison National Conference, I heard a delegate describe how the police service backroom staff functions like forensic was being cut in response to budget cuts. In the West Midlands, 50 private security staff recruited by G4S now carry out criminal investigations for the CID department, replacing what previously done by police uh, helping with, uh, with the house, uh, with the house to house inquiries into burglaries, car crime, robbery, giving evidence in court, and undertaking what is being described uh, as a sensitive, high-profile cases under uh, limited supervision. Congress, the Scottish government, are reported as, be, as about to have a crackdown in, in security firms run by gangs. Police Scotland and the Justice uh, Secretary Michael Matheson has signalled the need for a new approved industry, a security industry approved contractor scheme. There's something going on and we need to be aware of it. Congress, the public uh, bad private good argument I fear detracts the attention of some of our unions from the fact that there seems to be no limits to where national security services are protected from profit seeking tentacles on the, on the now uh, democratically unaccountable uh, profiteers. Congress, unless we, the trade union movement, assert a position of there are limits to how far control of our national security and criminal justice system is, is removed from the public service model to a profit-driven, unaccountable system, Congress, our national security and criminal justice system cannot be allowed to be influenced, controlled by dubiously owned profiteers. Congress, I move. Please support. Do we have a seconder? Thanks, President Congress. Phil Fairley from the Prison Officers Association. Um, I, I'm simply getting up because I didn't see a, 
<coughs> excuse me, I didn't see a second there. there. Um, I think, given that the, the proposer has said, and the motion pretty much covers what this is about. And actually, if you add it to what was said in, in motion 51, in and around what life is like inside a private prison from the, the delegate from community, that's all the information any of us should need um, to know to support this, this motion. Anybody who thinks that the privatisation of any of these services um, is good value for money just needs to look at the costs for Adiwell, which is a, the latest private prison in Scotland. The cost of that contract, by the end of its full term, is over a billion pounds worth of money coming out of the public sector and the public purse. <coughs> that in itself is confirmation of just how ludicrous a decision it was to put that in the hands of the private sector, not just because of the purse, but because of the conditions in which the staff have been asked to work in. I would ask you to support the motion. Thank you. We will now move to the vote. All those in favour, please show. Thank you. Any against? Any abstentions? Motion 53 is carried. Now call motion 54, Scottish Ambulance Service, to be moved by GMB Scotland. Good morning, John Mann, Scott Zamblin Service, uh, GMB Blanche, moving motion 54. I have been with the Amblin Service now for 30 years and I've covered all departments from patient transport service to paramedic response units to ambulance helicopters. And before there's any comments, there must have been a Chinook, uh, that was many years ago. Um, and I have never seen the Amblin Service in such a crisis as it is at the moment. For members, our members make life-saving decisions every day and do this under stress, overworked, tired and underpaid. This motion is calling for the support of the STUC to help sort out the ambulance service. For many years now, many members of the staff do 12-hour shifts with no breaks. This has been up, brought up time after time and again, but the situation is not good enough. Conference we are, under, we are under resourced, and this is no fault of the ambulance service. It is not uncommon for members being called out to attend a treble nine call without having had time to, to ensure that their ambulance is safe and the equipment has been checked and restocked. Clearly, this could put lives at risk. We believe stress levels within the ambulance service is at an all-time high. We accept that the job we do is stressful and challenging, but management make it worse with a lack of brakes, equipment and people. The ambulance service should not be run on bare bone of staff numbers and stretching every single worker to limit on every shift. That is why we are carrying out a campaign across the service to establish how bad stress is within the workplace and what we can do to reduce the stress levels. We need everyone's support through, through this campaign. One day, anyone in this room may need the ambulance service. And do you want a paramedic who has just done 11 hour shifts without a break attending you? The Scottish Ambulance Service is also the only ambulance service within the UK who still have an on call working service. The on call policy that is in place in Scotland needs to be scrapped. The rest of the UK has deemed this working practice unworkable, yet we continue to use it up here in Scotland, this policy that needs to be addressed. We have members who work 12-hour shifts on call. They only get paid £18 for that 12 hours. If that member of the staff gets called out at 2 o'clock in the morning and they do a 30-minute call, they only get paid for the 30 minutes. They do not take into to, um, sorry. They don't take in fact into the fact that the family have been disturbed, the household have been woken up, and when the member of the staff returns to his bed, it may take him a couple of hours to return to sleep. We have crews who also work 12 hours on a station and then two 12 hours on call. 
These crews can do up to 22 hours without a break. We understand that some rural areas cannot justify having crews on 24 hours, but the stations that have staff who do 12 hours on station and then 12 hours on call up to seven days in a row should be considered to become a 24-hour station. It has also come to light that the staff within the Scottish Ambulance Service have been underbanded compared to the rest of the UK for a number of years. We ask that the banding is re looked at and addressed so members are paid the same as ambulance staff in the other parts of the UK. The Ambulance Service has not been immune to the public sector cuts. We need to address the funding gap in the service to make the best ambulance service, not only in the UK but the world. The staff deserve that, and so do the public. We cannot play with people's lives like, like this anymore. It's time for the Scottish Government to work with the GMB to ensure the funding is there to make it a top-class service. Support this motion and let us give the workers in the ambulance service a fair pay and a service that the staff and the public deserve. We ask you to support this motion. Thank you. Do you have a second there? Ross Baxter McGee, Society of Radiographers. The NHS is an institution we're all very proud of, but Congress, the NHS is on its knees. Over 60 years ago, Nye Bevan resigned as the Health Secretary when the NHS started to drift away from his vision. If he could see what's being done to this service now, he would be ashamed. All the NHS wants to do and all the workers in the NHS want to do is provide the service that the patients deserve, a first-class service. But when we are overstretched, under-resourced, underpaid, that is not a service that we can provide. The NHS is made up of all sorts of professions and the Society of Radiographers stands in arms with all of them as we campaign for the, ter the service that we want to deliver. Jeremy Hunt has been demonising the NHS and the media for the past year and a half. And the NHS has suffered from that. And when you read about the NHS and the media, all you ever hear on the positive side of things is doctors and nurses are overstretched. Doctors and nurses are overstretched. But what about everyone else? The physios, the dieticians, the podiatrists, the radiographers, the Scottish Ambulance Service. Everyone is struggling in these times. <laughs> we must com campaign together to ensure that these services continue and that the NHS is free at the point of delivery. We stand together with the Scottish Ambulance Service as they campaign for service that they want to provide. And we stand with all other health unions. Please support the motion. Thank you. We will now move to the vote. All those in favour, please show. Thank you. Any against? Any abstentions? Motion 54 is carried. We will now have a comfort break um, for 17 minutes, I think. Um, can, you, can you please, please ensure you're back for 11 prompt? Thank you. Motion 53 will be taken, or 55, will be taken at the start of the public services at 11.40 this morning.